Stanford University. This is Natalie Marine Street with the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program. Today is August 12, 2016, and I'm here with Gavin Wright for the second part of our oral history interview. We spent a lot of time in the last session talking about your time at New Haven, and um, I want to talk a little bit about how you got from New Haven um, to Michigan and what uh, the economics department was like there. Yes. Uh, well, after the second Hank Parker for mayor campaign proved to be unsuccessful, 1971, it did occur to me uh, that if I really was ever going to get back on track uh, with my academic career, uh, getting away for a time ought to be uh, a good idea. And uh, the University of Chicago uh, had a postdoc uh, opportunity. Uh, and actually, one of my thesis advisors was uh, Mark Nerlov, an econometrician who had gone from Yale to Chicago in the meantime. So he encouraged me to come. And it was also the time when Robert Fogel uh, was a very active new economic historian and climatrician at Chicago. Uh, and he, too, uh, encouraged me to uh, come out there. So it was an interesting year. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it in connection with the slavery topic. But during the course of the year, uh, another old friend uh, from grad school, Gary Saxonhouse. Gary was a Japan specialist whose first love was economic history. He called from Michigan, uh, his new home, and uh, they were looking to expand in this hot new field, economic history. And would I be interested in coming up, uh, perhaps even for a tenured offer? So uh, we went up and visited. Uh, it was a little spooky for my wife, Katha, since she came from uh, Detroit and certainly never imagined that she'd be moving back to Michigan. But to make a long story short, it seemed like a very congenial place uh, and a place that was looking to build in economic history. Uh, and uh, here was a real clincher, two other young couples, each of them with uh, new young kids, had formed a playgroup, Saxon Houses, were one, and Ron Lee, a historical demographer, was another. Uh, and we were very modern. It was a play group in which the husbands were going to take equal share in the time with the, with the wives. And so we had a community. Uh, and uh, it really seemed like uh, uh, just about the right kind of both uh, community in Ann Arbor and in the uh, ec economics department. So we had a very good year, a good decade uh, in the 70s. I remember thinking that uh, sometime in the distant future, we'll look back on those ye these years as a golden age. And the reason that's such an ironic thing is, economically speaking, it was a terrible decade. <laughs> uh, inflation, stagnation, uh, I mean, the economic advisors, uh, some very good people, uh, uh, macroeconomic modelers at Michigan, and they were tying, uh, tied up in knots trying to figure out what was happening and why the uh, forecasts were going so bad. Uh, now, fortunately, most of my own research was not directly impinged uh, by that. Uh, so uh, in terms of family history, uh, I think we do look back on it as a kind of golden age. Uh, and those kids who grew up together in the playgroup uh, uh, have remained friends uh, in later life. Uh, so uh, that's basically the setting. Maybe I should move on to a little bit more about what research I was doing. I explained that I got onto the topic of Southern economic history, mainly because my advisor, Bill Parker, uh, handed me a kind of fresh, virtually untouched uh, data set, the parker Gallman sample from the 1860 manuscript census. That sample was designed to test the Douglas North hypothesis about interregional trade. In retrospect, that seems uh, unfortunate because uh, that was a somewhat ephemeral, ephemeral hypothesis. And the real interest was going to be about slavery and the slave economy and its economic performance and many other features. <coughs> 
but uh, I was working away, but like a lot of grad students, having uh, some difficulty in identifying exactly what my main hypotheses were. Uh, and it was really the emergence of the work by Fogel and Engerman coming out of Chicago that I was exposed to during that postdoc year that helped me to define my uh, questions and that showed me that I could uh, play a distinctive role uh, in this whole uh, debate. So in a nutshell, uh, Fogel and Engerman argued that slavery was very efficient, that it was very profitable, it was very economically successful, uh, and they went on to argue uh, it was not all that bad in terms of the well-being of the slaves, as indicated by such measures as their height, and they even flirted with the uh, idea that the slaves, or many of the slaves, actually bought into the system and were working hard because they had a kind of well-designed system of uh, positive incentives. Well, laying that out there it was a real shocker, uh, not just to the economic history field and to the history field, but to the broader public. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I was of mixed minds because as I was first learning about these findings, many of them did seem exciting and original, uh, but as I began to go back to my own work, I began to realize that uh, my research had the basis for an important critique uh, of this vir all, virtually all these claims. Uh, number one, I would worked on the history of cotton demand, that is the connection between the emerging industrial revolution in Britain uh, and the cotton, American cotton south. And what I was able to show was uh, that uh, there was a rapid cotton boom averaging 5% growth per year. Uh, pretty much all the way from 1800 to 1860, but that in the latter part of that 19th century, it slowed down drastically. So much of what Fogel and Engerman were portraying as a dynamic, growing economy, uh, it was true. Uh, but it was being aided by this tailwind of outside demand, and I think that economy would have slowed down and sunk into uh, a backward condition even if you did not have uh, the Civil War and the abolition of slavery. Second point was looking at the cross-section relationships, the claim about economies of scale, uh, which is what Fogel and Engerman argued. What I was able to show is if you look at the composition of output going all the way across the spectrum from small farms to large slave plantations, it was systematically related to the share of cotton in total production, that is the crop mix. Uh, small farms appear to be less efficient, but that's largely because they were growing a lot less cotton. Uh, and that powerful correlation uh, actually wipes out uh, any economies of scale. Now, uh, in later years, I was able to improve on my uh, analysis of that, uh, but for present purposes, let me uh, argue this way that what emerged was a different perspective, a synthesis in which the real benefits from slavery, there certainly were benefits to the owners, but they came about because of the commodification of labor under slavery. Um, and that term really has a pretty direct meaning, that because there was a price tag uh, on labor and because the owner had the wherewithal of assigning labor to whatever location he wanted, to whatever task he wanted, they were able to mobilize women for field work in addition to men. That is where the gains were coming from. And there's a broader point here. The broader point here is that my interpretation uh, was understandable and couched in historical context. Uh, the reason that there was such a premium on slave labor in the early 19th century American South was that labor was extremely scarce. So owning that labor gave the owner uh, a real leverage. Uh, and owning the male and female labor in a kind of crop setting where you could deploy both of them, unlike free families, which are governed by or influenced by all manner of social customs uh, and kinship connections and religious feelings and norms and so on, uh, when it came to slavery, slavery was commodified. Uh, so I think uh, 
that's really, that was the essence of my message in the kind of anti-Time on the Cross volume that came out in 1976, uh, Reckoning with Slavery. And it, uh, and it was the basic theme of my own book uh, that came out in 1978, The Political Economy uh, of the Cotton South. So that's how I went from a kind of struggling grad student to a, uh, a person. I'm very glad I didn't put my thesis out for publication right away because it would have been much less, much more like a thesis and much less like a kind of polished uh, new uh, interpretation. So all that was happening uh, while I was at Michigan. And uh, as I say, we, the family, everyone was happy at Michigan. But uh, by chance, we had an invitation to go out uh, for a sabbatical, really not a sabbatical, for a teaching away from home year at uh, Berkeley, 1974-75. Richard Such was going on sabbatical and I was replacing him. We even lived in the Such's house. Uh, well, that was our very first exposure to life in California. Neither of us had ever set foot in California before that time. Uh, it was fun, it was a lot of hard work. Uh, we did, at that time, there was a very active Stanford Berkeley Economic History Seminar. It met every month. So I got in a carload, came over to Stanford. I was amazed at the difference in the, uh, the microclimate. Berkeley is the hills and windy and cold and Stanford is the lowlands with pines and palm trees. And uh, I came over and I met uh, Nate Rosenberg, uh, who had only recently joined the Stanford faculty. Uh, and I renewed my acquaintance with uh, Paul David. Uh, let me talk a little more about Paul David. Really, my first contact with him, sorry to jump around in terms of time, but I think it's necessary to tell the story. I was giving a paper, kind of a survey of the new economic history at the meetings of the American Economic Association in New York City, uh, December 1969. Uh, Paul was my discussant and he wrote a lengthy set of comments. Paul is known for the length of his comments. However, on this occasion, uh, he never made it to New York because of a snowstorm. Coming down from New Haven, I could do it. But I never met Paul, but I did read his lengthy comments, which really were using that occasion to write what became the lead chapter in his own book, published a couple of years later, really a statement of a kind of a manifesto of the case for historical economics. Uh, that the Cleometrics, or the new economic agenda, he argued, was losing its direction if it regarded itself as just a matter of applying economics to historical data. Uh, instead, uh, a better perspective is that the historical approach is a distinctive method of approach to the whole study of economic life. Uh, well, I became a convert in reading that essay, and I've been one ever since. Uh, and that's what I have in mind when I say that uh, I think there is a distinctive Stanford tradition uh, in economic history summarized in the slogan, History Matters. Okay, going back to the 70s, uh, we went back to Michigan. But Stanford was looking to expand in economic history. So I had another invitation for a chance to come out to Stanford. Uh, once again, uh, Paul David was on sabbatical, uh, so again, I didn't see him. I was replacing him uh, in his teaching. But we did get the experience of life uh, on the peninsula and life with the Stanford economics community. And it was indeed very impressive, very congenial. Uh, at that time, there was talk about an offer, but uh, these things often take time. So we went back to Michigan, and it was not until 1981 that the offer actually came through. And I, as I say, I was happy at Michigan and I would have been happy to spend the rest of my career at Michigan. But I knew that I would have much better access to students, grad students, interested in economic history. Uh, there was a regular course, a requirement in the PhD program, plus a very active seminar. Whereas at Michigan, despite my efforts to get the program going, uh, it was very small, and it was likely to stay small in the future. So it really was not primarily California lifestyle, uh, but what I took to be the health and robustness of the field of economic history, 
that, uh, that ma made my decision for me uh, to come out to Stanford given the opportunity. Describe for me a little bit um, what the network of economic historians at that time looked like. So Stanford was a center and Berkeley were there. There really is uh, only a handful. I mean, depending on you, how you count them, maybe it would be five to ten centers, uh, hubs of activity uh, in economic history. And that was true then and it's true now, though they've uh, moved around a bit. Uh, of course, Yale was one. Uh, maybe Harvard was another. Columbia revived an older economic history workshops. We used to come down. But uh, really, in a way, the center of action in those decades, 60s and 70s, was moving to Chicago. And it really was Bob Fogel uh, that, was, uh, that was responsible. He made a big splash with an early book about the railroads, and then he moved on to slavery, which was even more uh, explosive. Uh, now, uh, there was a West Coast network too, but uh, distance being what it was in those days, I was unacquainted uh, with it. Uh, so you'd almost have to come out here in order to get the idea, well, different schools, different, uh, have different schools of thought, uh, different workshops, different conventions. Uh, that's a sign of health. It's not, hopefully it doesn't descend into a sense of rivalry. But uh, I argue, right on the bulletin board over there, you may see a handwritten list there, I argue that we at Stanford have the largest number of currently active um, economic historians of any program uh, in the country. A few of them predate my time here. Uh, the other major name that I should be mentioning here is Moses Abramovitz. Uh, who also came out right around 1949, 1950. He was one of the builders of the Stanford Department and one of the pioneers in the study of long-term uh, economic uh, growth accounting. Uh, and uh, the world's best <laughs> advisor, sympathizer, uh, well into his retirement, he would come every week to the workshop and always have thoughtful comments and uh, suggestions. So you can't buy <laughs> this commodity. Uh, but you almost have to be part of the group in order to get a, a sense uh, of uh, uh, what the prevailing terms of discourse are. And now, is every one of those 36 names uh, a kind of active adherent of the Stanford School in Economic History? No way. Uh, they're all over the map. Uh, they're at universities. And, and I don't even count those who are not economic historians, but who got historical thinking uh, embedded in their, in their background. Uh, really, I've almost mentioned all of the major centers that still survive. A few of them were active at a time, such as Wisconsin. It's been gone. Economic history has been gone there for years. Same for Illinois. Uh, UCLA uh, still going strong, so uh, in a way, we uh, West Coasters tend to think that the West Coast is more of the center. I realize your question was a little more about how the networks work. I mean, who your advisor was uh, is obviously important. Where you came from is important, but uh, there, there, it really doesn't work. Uh, well. Questions of appointments and reputation and, and quality advice, they certainly do operate uh, in that way. But it's not as though uh, people are actively trying to promote their own uh, uh, people in any uh, uh, improper way. So we'd like to think that when a student comes out on the market, a Stanford PhD candidate in economic history has a good bit of reputational capital going for them, uh, and that that would be the case uh, pretty much anywhere they might be um, uh, applying for a job. Right. When uh, a graduate student comes to, to study, um, did they study economic history, or is it, did they study economics? No, it's got to be a PhD in economics. And it's one of the sad trends in our, uh, in the broader field of economic history, which is virtually the only access mode is a PhD in economics. Uh, and that means that the technical standards for admission are extremely high, worldwide competition, uh, and uh, 
that there, you're getting an awful lot of training in advanced topics which may or very likely may not be of direct use to you in your work uh, in economic history. So I've often thought uh, we really, by we, I don't necessarily mean that the economics department should do this, but somebody should have something like a master's level training program in historical economics or in economics for people who want to study uh, economic history because there are many people, PhD candidates in history nowadays, especially those with uh, this new revival of interest in the new history of capitalism, where as uh, far as I can see, they're not anti-economics. Uh, they're, they're not approaching the whole subject with the idea that they're going to overthrow uh, the discipline of economics. But uh, what they lack is a accessible kind of middle range uh, exposure and training. Uh, we do have such programs in public policy uh, and in uh, other venues, but not in economic history. But uh, anyway, that's the reality. Is, uh, uh, it, it's actually quite rare for a, an admissions candidate into the Stanford PhD program to say that they want to study economic history. Uh, usually it's something that they haven't even heard of uh, until they get here. And over the years, uh, Paul David and Abner Greif and now Ron Abramitsky, they've been extremely successful in inspiring young people, uh, acquainting them to the possibilities and also showing them that they can study economic history and make use of their tools and capabilities uh, in a uh, constructive way. But uh, there's no other way in, uh, uh, with rare exceptions. Right. You mentioned that it's rare now for an applicant to mention that they want to study economic history. Yeah. Was that the case in the 80s when you came to Stanford? I think it would have been more common. Uh, now, let me give you a little more context uh, there. Uh, there was a revolution here of sorts before I ever got here, and that is the rise of radical economics or alternative economics. Uh, there was certainly widespread uh, discontent with what was taken to be the static, uh, old-fashioned, socially uh, unaware status of old line of mainstream economics. And so there was a demand on the part of the students to teach alternatives. You might say Marxist economics, although I think other kinds of alternatives were welcomed. So that field, alternative approaches, had been established before I came here. Uh, it was a two-member field. Uh, it was uh, uh, Jack Gurley, who had been in financial economics and became an enthusiast for Maoist uh, approaches. And then Don Harris, uh, who was uh, hired from Wisconsin, and who, by the way, is the father of uh, Kamala Harris, who is currently running f uh, for U.S. Senate uh, from uh, California. Uh, well. Uh, Quite a few of our best economic history students came to Stanford intending to study radical economics or Marxist economics or some kind of alternative economics. And when they got here, they found that that field was not very well defined uh, and that they could accomplish much of what they were hoping to do in terms of an alternative approach by moving into economic history. So I'll, I'll mention my uh, own student, uh, Warren Watley. Uh, as uh, a case in point, and uh, later, uh, since you're asking about networks, uh, it was the year before both of us left Michigan. Glenn Lowry and I pooled our capital and uh, persuaded Michigan to bring Warren Watley to the campus, and he spent the whole rest of his career. He's recently re retired, but that's uh, that was the channel. I, I do think there was, a, there was more, in a sense, one sense, more diversity in the potential fields of interest uh, of candidates. In another sense, there was less diversity because they were much more domestic Americans and uh, today we get a, a global peer, uh, pool. But, and, and I don't want to say that today's students are all regimentedly cut from the same cloth. No, a lot of diversity there. But many of them will have advanced master's degrees in mathematical statistics uh, or have work experience uh, or something like that. So they're all at a very high technical level and that's another way in which uh, it's a problem for us in economic history because we certainly don't want to say uh, 
Now, we don't believe that economic history should be a kind of watered down version. You know, ideally, to be good, you have to be really good in economics and also uh, an accomplished uh, historical scholar, too. Uh, but that's very demanding, which is why I often say we are destined to remain an elite field, uh, e even if we like to grow, because the, uh, the demands are very high. I've always been a little bit puzzled by um, the departmental lines between the, you know, the history departments and economic de departments, where a lot of economic history you know, yeah. is taking place. And I wondered if you have sensed a change in that over time, or have those lines always been there? Or? Well, I can't really tell you what's always been there. I'll just tell you what I know. Uh, one of the reasons that we have such a, a goodly number of economic historians uh, coming out of Stanford uh, is the Steve Haber connection. When I got here, Steve was, an exception to everything I was just saying, he was an economic historian, a Latin American specialist, but an economic historian in the history department. And so he had a number of uh, very good students who were eager to come over to economics, take our courses, have us serve on their committee, and a number of them are pursuing active uh, careers. But Steve was discontented uh, in history, uh, and uh, at some point along the way, uh, he moved over to political science. So now we have uh, uh, where he continues to do what I consider economic history. We don't make a sharp distinction between political processes and economic processes anyway. And so Steve, in his political science hat, has had a number of uh, promising students. And I've served on uh, a handful of committees. Uh, so in that sense, uh, certainly between political science and economics, there are not rigid lines. You know, overlapping interests, overlapping students, collaboration uh, is pretty common. But the connections to the history department uh, have, are not as strong, have not been as strong as they were, say, back in the 80s. Uh, we were talking about Jim Campbell uh, as an example. First time I saw him after many years, he's come over and reminded me uh, of uh, how much he had valued taking my graduate course in economic history when Jim was a grad student uh, here. Really, it's been quite a while since uh, I've had a grad student in history. I think there have been a few uh, in Abner Greif or Ron Abramitsky's classes, but the numbers are not great. And at this point, I don't think it's because of ideological differences or uh, refusal to uh, entertain each other's ideas. No, it's more that people tend to uh, drift uh, in their current channels, and that's as true in economics as it is in other fields. And so it takes an exceptional individual or sometimes an exceptional individual faculty member uh, to break out of that mold. So let's hope that happens right. again in the future. Well, since you brought up the new interest in the history of capitalism, I want to ask you about that now. What do you sort of think of this as a subfield of history? Um, do you see some overlap with my, your field? Uh, my broad reaction is uh, I'm delighted to see it. I'm delighted to see it because uh, history students are interested in, in markets uh, and in finance uh, and in economic topics. And that is a change after a long swing. I don't want to try to give precise dates, but somewhere between the 70s and uh, the turn of the century, uh, history took a cultural turn uh, and uh, um, active retreat from quantification or social science or anything uh, connected to it. Uh, and uh, there really was a kind of generational uh, effect to it. Certainly the, my generation, the people like Jack Rakove or David Kennedy uh, and others, there was certainly no problem uh, working together, communicating and so on. That was less true of the younger generation, but I think it, it is now um, changing. So that's the good side. Uh, the bad side is they often want to plunge right in uh, and think that they're uh, kind of rewriting uh, all history without really doing justice to what's been written before. And this is especially true in a topic like slavery. So I don't want to interpret the whole initiative uh, in terms of the literature on slavery because it's more. But slavery has been a favorite topic and for under understandable reasons. But uh, 
this tendency to move almost immediately to a kind of global sense of, if not conspiracy, at least uh, a global level um, evil empire uh, conjunction between slavery and capitalism, uh, it's much too quick. Uh, and it t tends too much to rely on a kind of moralistic uh, approach. And uh, I've read, I think, as many as a handful of survey articles on this very topic. Three major books on the uh, revisiting the economic history of uh, slavery. And what I just said, I think, applies to a greater or lesser extent to all of them. Uh, and uh, it's too bad. I hope we can recover from that. Because, you know, after the time on the cross uh, upheaval, slavery became a kind of untouchable topic within economic history. And that has now changed. Uh, so let's hope it doesn't happen again, that we go our separate ways, because it's unnecessary. Uh, when I was describing the, the insights that I think I've worked out about the long-term economic effects of slavery, I mean, at the time I was starting on this in the 60s, the economic backwardness of the South was the most pressing thing to be explained. Uh, and that was closely related to uh, the economic disadvantage of the African-American population. Uh, so what I worked out had to do with how the property rights of ownership uh, really changed the incentives. That this debate about were the slave owners capitalist interpreted as were they acquisitive, uh, were they rational, were they calibrating, that is not the issue. The issue was given their property rights, given the structure of their economic interests, uh, in what directions were economic incentives driving them. Uh, and they were not driving them, this was the essence of my case, uh, towards building up infrastructure, towards building up cities, uh, building up universities. They were certainly not driving them to recruiting uh, uh, immigrant labor uh, from overseas. And this was the reason. These were the mechanisms. So I, I think that, those, that line of argument has uh, held up pretty well. But I would be the first to acknowledge that is not the totality of what you would want to know about slavery. Uh, that is very much an economist's conception about how the, uh, how the system worked as a system and what its uh, consequences were. Uh, the human reality may be harder to get at, and certainly harder to get at with precision, but certainly needs to be studied. And many people uh, are doing their best with a whole range of different tools. So that's why I say. <laughs> We, we should not be dividing. <laughs> uh, both sides need the other uh, in terms of uh, uh, both keeping themselves, keeping each other honest and uh, deploying insights from um, all sides of that spectrum. Okay. Um, it seems like there was a little bit of a shift in the trajectory of your research uh, at some point from looking at these regional economic development issues to uh, a concern with natural resources. And well, I very much if so. You could talk uh, about that. When I came here in 1982, I was right in the middle of writing a book about uh, long-term Southern economy. I wanted to do a kind of a sequel to the book on the cotton slave economy, and this was really the post-Civil War economy. Uh, and uh, I finished that, and it came out in 1986. That's called uh, Old South, New South, uh, a title suggested by my colleague Victor Fuchs. But really, uh, out here, I found uh, not that many people were interested in the South, or so it seemed to me. Now, I could have cultivated, I knew uh, Carl Degler uh, had an interest, there were people in, in the history, but not, it, it wasn't the same kind of pressing topic. What was pressing among American economists in the 80s was how we were losing the battle to Japan. Uh, this fear that the U.S. was losing its technological leadership, and you use a phrase like that to an economic historian, and the natural question is, what do you mean, technological leadership? Where did it come from? Where did we ever get the idea that this one country should be the leader across the board? So Paul David and I, uh, and this it did have to do with the early days of uh, CEPR, we started a project on identifying uh, the sources of American technological leadership. And it won't surprise you to hear, our answer was history. They came out of a particular conjunction of historical settings. 
uh, in which the U.S. was able to build up an infrastructure which then uh, spilled over into uh, more modern forms. But it was the discovery I made in the course of doing a very straightforward, ordinary uh, factor content study of American trade patterns that it hit me that the most salient feature of American manufacturing exports, this is during the time of American ascendancy to world leadership, 1870 to 1920, the most salient feature was uh, intensity in non-renewable natural resources, namely minerals. So I looked at that, began to write about it, talk about it, and I came upon a further discovery, which is that the U.S. was the world's leading supplier of virtually every one of the major industrial minerals of that day, as of 1913, before World War I. And you look at that and think, wow, you know, how could a country with that rich a geological endowment not have become the world's leader in something? And actually, the Wall Street Journal asked me to write up a little op-ed piece uh, about this. And I, when I wrote it up, they gave it the caption, U.S. economic success based on luck, not skill, says Stanford economist. <laughs> and when I saw that in cold print, I realized, you know, I don't think that is what I want to be saying. It looks that way. Uh, and if you cling to the idea that natural resources are an endowment given by nature, then that is the way you'll think. But the more I looked, and the more Paul David and I began to work on it, the more we decided that uh, we changed our slogan. Natural resources are not natural. Uh, and after spending a year at the Humanities Center, I learned to say, Natural resources are not natural, they are socially constructed. Uh, really, uh, what we're able to show is that if you look at modern day estimates of the uh, resource base of all the different continents, countries of the world, and then take all the minerals that are taken out of the ground and put them back in the ground, North America was no better endowed than any other continent. No, that alleged endowment, that so-called endowment, was the product of development. And that development, the closer you look, involved a lot of exploration. I mean, that goes back to the gold rush, if not before. People looking around where the gold had been there for a long time, but you had to have people looking for it and knowing what they found when they had it. Uh, but not just ordinary miners and prospectors going around, what we found was that higher order forms of knowledge were being deployed. Uh, in fact, it's really only in geology and the related uh, mineralogy sciences that the U.S. had anything close to world leadership status uh, in a scientific field uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, so this is very relevant for a place like Stanford University because although it was Cal, not uh, Stanford, that was the world's lar largest mining school as of 1901, our first and most famous uh, graduate was none other than Herbert Hoover. And I just saw a tour guide this morning and overheard him say, yeah, that tower's named for Herbert Hoover, who was a Stanford graduate and went on to become president. Well, that little spiel was leaving out <laughs> Uh, Herbert Hoover's main claim to fame uh, in, in between, namely he was a mining engineer and a mining engineer who made fortunes on four continents, North America, Australia, China, and Russia, maybe that's only three, uh, and it's because the U.S. was the world's leading nation in mining engineering and in science-based mineral development. So that's where that, uh, that mineral base uh, came from. Uh, and that insight has led me into an engagement with the whole field known as the resource curse uh, hypothesis because uh, I might have been willing to say, well, the U.S. was exceptional. Other countries have resources, but they don't do what the U.S. did. But I later come to think, well, other countries have done. Uh, and uh, the path of resource-based development is actually open and very promising for those countries that are in position to invest in the kind of knowledge-based uh, infrastructure uh, that the U.S. had. Uh, Australia, Norway, uh, Canada, uh, 
uh, Chile. Uh, these would all be examples of successful resource-based economies uh, in the modern world. So, okay, that's what's nice about academic life. The path of learning will lead you like a mining uh, channel um, in directions that you never anticipated when you start out. I was wondering if um, being here at Stanford and with an office in the shadow of the Hoover Tower, um, did that influence at all your, your ability to sort of come up with that, that thesis? I mean, did you think about Herbert Hoover at all? Or? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, it was only when I began to read everything there is to read about uh, minerals uh, that I realized, well, uh, Herbert and uh, you know his wife, Lou Henry Hoover, was also uh, a geology uh, student. Uh, and she said afterwards, some of this you can learn by just going into the tower and, uh, and reading about her, uh, she said, well, she majored in Herbert Hoover. But the truth was, uh, she was also a good student, but there was no career opportunity for her uh, in the field of her major. So uh, yeah, she made a good uh, presidential spouse, but she might also have made a good uh, mining engineer. Uh, so, no, it only came much later, uh, and uh, obviously uh, I've come to a somewhat warmer appreciation for Herbert Hoover as a historical figure than probably most, uh, uh, most people do who only know him from uh, his days presiding over the Great Depression. Right. I wanted to ask about a, um, another publication that you were involved with, uh, which lots of students of history and economics, I imagine, use, which is the historical statistics of the United States. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your involvement with that project? Yes, another good example of a project that just kind of starts and you unsuspectingly get caught up in it and uh, it leads uh, in to directions you can hardly imagine. Uh, the reference work, historical statistics of the United States, is one of the basic reference works of American history. Uh, and there were a number of editions put out by the Commerce Department. This was a case, federal government producing a public good, mobilizing knowledge from scholars all over the country, uh, and uh, several volumes that expanded in size over time. And the most ambitious by far was the one known as the Bicentennial Edition. It came out in 1976, and it covered historical statistics from colonial times to 1970, so it had an end date. But as time went on, the 80s, and of course the 70s weren't included, the 90s, uh, people began to ask, well, when is the next issue going to come out? So uh, there was a committee appointed by the Economic History Association to go to the Commerce Department and lobby them for a new edition. That's all we were, a lobby. And their answer was, we don't do that kind of thing anymore. Everyone who was involved with that project is retired. We wouldn't know how to get started. If you think it's so important, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it happened. Uh, and they said they, they would offer to help. They would tell their people to cooperate in any way. And they would even give us a written assurance, if we wanted to go to a publisher, that they were not planning to put out uh, another volume that would compete with ours. So uh, a group just formed more or less in an ad hoc way. You can tell from the geography, we were all pretty near each other here in the Northern California uh, area. It was Richard Such and Susan Carter, and Alan Olmsted from uh, Davis, and another young political scientist uh, up at Davis. Uh, and uh, Mike Haynes was the one Easterner, uh, but we needed a demographer. Uh, and we had a few meetings and decided to come up with a proposal and to take it to publishers and to make a long story short, uh, Cambridge University Press was interested. Because uh, we thought we, we needed uh, some kind of backing. Uh, and we actually formed a, a corporation called uh, Cleometrica uh, so that there would be some, the press would have someone to, to deal with if the composition of the group should change. Uh, and of course, it took a lot longer and became a lot bigger than we ever thought. Uh, it actually came out as five volumes. Probably most users use the online edition uh, nowadays, uh, especially uh, if you want to download data, which you can conveniently do. So uh, in the end, I felt pretty good about having been part of this very useful project. Uh, it has had its uh, frustrations because we wanted to, in addition to uh, 
not just putting out the, the tables. You want to have detailed source notes and discussion about potential weaknesses, alternative assumptions that were made, uh, and include essays about um, what to make of it, some advice, some, some, some charts, and so on. So it, it fell to me and other members of the editorial board to recruit chapter editors to write these essays. Some people were very eager to do it. Uh, others, like fishery, uh, fisheries, I found great experts in the field, applauded what we were doing, but they didn't want to take on this assignment. I'll tell you one that uh, makes a good story. Uh, they said early on, we have to have a chapter on American Indians. There's a big demand for a chapter on American Indians, and the previous uh, bicentennial edition, none of the previous editions had anything on it. So, okay, who's going to do our chapter on American Indians? I asked around, I got nowhere, and following one lead, it came to my attention that the leading expert on quantitative aspects of American Indian history was a guy who had just joined the Stanford Sociology Department, Matt Snip. <laughs> so here I am calling my own colleague that I've never met, uh, uh, heard of, and trying to get him to do this uh, worthy deed. And when I explained the first few minutes, Matt said, well, I feel a moral obligation that there should be such a chapter and that I should do it. And if I could have hugged him over the phone, I would have done it because that's the reaction that everybody should have. He wrote a darn good chapter. The tables are good, very carefully selected, and, a, and an excellent uh, introductory essay. Now, whether these essays are, ever get read by anybody, the complaint is people just want numbers, and they dive in for the numbers and never read all the accompanying uh, caveats. But nonetheless, we did our best. Well, so, I've, I've read them and I've assigned them. Okay, so that is a, that is very nice to a, hear. At least a, at least one person. Yes. So. Okay, well, let's go back. Just to, I just want to talk a little bit about the department here. At, yeah. uh, I'm trying to get a sense in the 1980s what the culture of the department was like. Did you have meetings? What? How would you describe it? Uh, we certainly had meetings. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a new, uh, it's true, I, I was uh, a tenured professor, not quite the same as a new assistant professor, but even so, it takes a while to learn about the culture. Uh, one of the amazing things uh, is that departments do have cultures, and they are so local that really uh, we will be discussing uh, how things look from the vantage point of MIT or Harvard and others, uh, or even the Stanford Business School. And it's like we're discussing a foreign country and we don't really know how they do business and what they're talking about. But nonetheless, some of the internal rules and precedents uh, have persisted throughout my time. Uh, things like uh, the rule of thumb about you know, uh, tenure votes, you know, how many negative votes it takes before uh, a case is because it, it, you don't want to make a decision like that based on uh, majority vote. And uh, the practice when somebody cannot make a meeting, they can send in a message, but the practice was that we don't uh, uh, we don't read those messages until after the vote has been taken because that person has arrived at a position without having the benefit of hearing the discussion so it really you know from someone coming from a Quaker background uh, where the decision-making rule is you reach consensus and you struggle until you do well I don't say Stanford is quite like that but the idea that the internal deliberations really matter uh, was taken very seriously. Uh, and of course, the composition has changed quite a bit over the years, but I think that has changed quite a bit. Here's one other point. Uh, question of, of course, you have the standard university procedures. I mean, personnel issues are by far the most important thing. But uh, the issue is, what weight do you give to the outside letters? Compared this is regarding to, tenure. Well, tenure, or it could be a proposed uh, appointment. tenured appointment from outside. And our position, uh, you know, these things get repeated often, because even though I'm telling you uh, the continuity is very strong, but they have to be repeated, because <laughs> they're always new members. 
Our tradition is uh, we don't rely on the outside layers. We read the papers. We make our own decision. Now, there's a bit of presumptuous, presumptuousness in that. Uh, economics tells ourselves we have a, more of a unified paradigm than, say, history or political science. Well, more of a unified paradigm, but that certainly doesn't mean that everybody is an expert in everything. Uh, in fact, I sometimes think this tradition has a real downside. The downside being that if you're looking for diversity, methodological diversity, or a field like economic history, for example, it's not as though all economists should be judged on the basis of one set of traits that applies to everybody. But nonetheless, I admire and respect this tradition, uh, which is, sure, you're going to be influenced if some uh, respected person from the outside expresses an opinion. Uh, but we're not going to let someone else make our decisions for us. That's, uh, so uh, those are from some general uh, impressions. You know, uh, a name I should mention is Ken Arrow, uh, who is going to be 95 years old uh, later this month. And Ken had only recently come back to Stanford. Uh, he came here in 1949, but uh, went to Harvard in between and then came back to Stanford. Uh, getting to know him has been one of the greatest uh, aspects of my career at Stanford because Ken is interested in everything and everybody has a story. Uh, Nate Rosenberg, I remember him telling this story at uh, Ken's 65th birthday that you know some topic would come up in conversation and he said, Nate would say, he would cringe when Ken would turn to him and say, Nate, you're the historian. What do you think about uh, such and such? And of course, Subsequent discussion would bring out the fact that Ken knew more about the subject than anyone else uh, in the room. But it's not just the kind of photographic knowledge I'm talking about. It is a diversity of interest, interest in economic history, for example, uh, and uh, to the point of reading papers, coming to workshops, uh, inviting people to lunch to discuss them. Now, not everybody's like that, uh, but Ken is definitely exceptional. Uh, both in the brain power that he brings to the topic and in the range and diversity of his interests. But I did, between Ken and uh, Mo Abramovitz, uh, I certainly got the sense that this was an intellectually serious department, but not a embattled department. You hear cases of economics departments, maybe others, uh, that are consist of war, warring camps the theorists and the applied people. Berkeley uh, used to be two different buildings, uh, Evans and Barrows, and they hardly ever talked to each other. Stanford has never been like that. We sometimes have fierce arguments, but we have not had lasting cleavages uh, of uh, pros and cons. And so I've appreciated that too. Right. Tell me a little bit about these workshops that you've referred to. Uh, was this just within the economic history or the whole no, department? No, it, it's the basic building block of the program. You take uh, two years of coursework, but uh, I think virtually anyone would tell you this. You don't really begin to join the profession or get into a research field until you uh, enroll in a graduate workshop. So all the fields have workshops for third year students uh, and you're expected, uh, certainly part of your expectation for grad students is to be part of it uh, every week. Uh, and you'll hear, hear papers presented by our own faculty, by faculty from outside, uh, and the students are expected to present their own research, which is a pretty daunting thing uh, for them to do. But it's only there. I mean, you can read papers and you can be taught about how to uh, do certain uh, techniques. But it's the give and take of a close-up uh, discussion where you get a, a better idea about how research actually is conducted and what people uh, really think. Uh, and sure, often it is intimidating because you can hear some pretty harsh criticism. So in more recent years, uh, we've developed uh, various networks of lunches and informal discussion groups. People get to try out their ideas. Uh, with, among smaller groups, maybe only grad students, uh, and that's fine. Uh, it's, it's all a sign of, uh, sign of life, sign of uh, health, a sign of uh, people taking it all very seriously. Right. Let's take a break. Yep.